Yeah, so it's a huge question, but I think <laughs> the first thing that comes to mind is media in today's society, it's often fast, it's often in response to a short attention span. There can be this real focus on content that is identified as um, attracting interest quickly. So terms such as clickbait culture are really you know, commonplace when we're speaking about digital media in particular in contemporary society. But although there can be this emphasis on speed when it comes to content and media, I also think that there's a strong emphasis on engagement and the interactive nature of media. So with different digital developments, we've seen a move away from what once was a traditional one-to-many broadcast model and a move towards a more dialogic approach to media. And that's exciting in many different ways. It means that individuals from structurally marginalised groups who have historically often been excluded from media have been creating and producing media with a significant amount of impact. But that doesn't mean that there aren't still huge issues that need to be addressed and um, just because the media landscape has changed doesn't mean that those changes have resulted in an entirely equitable media environment. So I think there's definitely definitely still a presence when it comes to that sort of media, but there have been huge shifts that can't be ignored. So, you know, the decline of different print approaches to media, the pivot towards video that we've seen so many media organisations and outlets embrace in recent years. But that said, I think especially when we reflect on the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic and different crises that it interacts with, there's also the strong sense of nostalgia that some people have really been holding on to, and that includes nostalgia for a so-called um, golden age or a time before or the days that are regarded as normal which is some of what I explore when looking at the politics of notions of normality, media and consumer culture in my new book Consuming Crisis. So because of that we have seen you know some examples of a resurgence in terms of different approaches to print media or interest in radio or how podcast culture has changed and all of that is to say that although Media has definitely um, altered in ways that you know are absolutely undeniable. I think it's reductive to suggest that there is no place at all for radio, for newspapers, for print. Um, it's more about acknowledging how that sort of media has responded to changes in terms of demand and media production processes and thinking about well which audiences tend to be more interested in those examples why and how is that impacted by issues such as ongoing crises so I think some of the biggest changes include the role of digital remix culture and meme culture in all of this. So I teach a module that I developed on memes, digital remix culture and online inequalities. And yesterday, actually, I was having some really great conversations with students when we were speaking about what constitutes TV at this point in time. Is it about the device that you view the media through? Is it about you know gathering as a family around a television or streaming content on an online platform? And what that meant was we thought a lot about the role of digital remix culture, meme culture and live tweeting when it comes to television. That has been certainly a huge change that has impacted not only how media covers TV but also how TV is developed. So sometimes people will say they've engaged with something that feels as though the script was written with a social media audience in mind. Other times individuals will speak about how exciting it is to see the cast of a TV show that they enjoy and um, live tweeting and watching the TV show alongside fans. So overall, TV has changed in ways that are unmistakably connected to how digital culture has developed. And that includes the sense of participatory culture that can surround television, how that is impacted by fan communities, how that is shaped by different platforms and the ways that they rise in popularity and decline, and also how celebrity culture is entangled with all of this. The fact that parasocial relationships that are formed um, are really impacted by the different platforms and the different digital spaces that people can access. Definitely, definitely. I think there are so many different examples of this. So, you know, one of them is that there are times when a television show notices critiques that are being voiced online and as a result of that might actually make a change to the TV show, whether it's reintroducing a character, whether it's a reboot being, um, you know, sort of greenlit. Um, and all that's to say that 
the audience has perhaps to some extent more power than they once did in terms of the ability to really communicate and amplify their thoughts, their perspective, whether that's good or bad in response to a TV show. And we can even see examples of individuals involved in the production of TV being able to directly respond to audience members online. And um, there is a sense of some sense anyway of a conversation that can take place and that just wasn't possible previously or certainly not in the ways that we're seeing now. Yes, this is exactly what we we're having a discussion about yesterday. And I think it is. I think it's I think it's not just impacted by factors to do with generational differences. I think it is, you know, impacted by whether or not somebody lives on their own, who they might live with, the environment that they um, you know, work in the the different communities they are or aren't part of. So for some people, television is very closely tied to a a community oriented experience or a sense of coming together, gathering around a particular device to view with other people. It's a, a moment in the day that is, you know, marking dinner time or is marking connecting with those who you love. And for others, TV is, is less about that. It's about being able to access the sort of media that they find entertaining or, or content that's informative. So depending on who you ask, depending on the generational group that they are part of and other factors in their life, I think TV TV can mean many different things to many different people and for me I, I shared with my students I haven't actually lived somewhere with a TV set for over a decade but I, I regard myself as somebody who views a lot of TV but it's it's predominantly online. I think it depends on what sort of journalism we're speaking about. So I feel as though when we're dealing with mainstream mass media or mainstream yeah. journalism, however that's defined, that can look and operate in significantly different ways, depending on which part of the world we're dealing with, which organisations we're focusing on. And I think for me in all of this, although there are, are certainly times when the quality of some examples of journalism is questionable, whether that is in terms of, you know, inaccurate reporting and propaganda that's pushed. I also really want to acknowledge the fact that there are journalists that do phenomenal work, particularly with regards to independent journalism, investigative journalism and, you know, journalists who are really committed to values um, such as, you know, Re reporting the facts, values such as reporting information that highlights the experiences of those who are the most oppressed in society. Um, because of that, I feel as though I'm more hopeful about the state of journalism than not. Um, but I also recognise that a lot of the people who do that work do so in ways that are largely underfunded or unfunded yes. and also can, can can do that work in ways that comes at a great cost to their life including the the harms the risks the forms of abuse and harassment that journalists are exposed to so i think there will always be people committed to doing this work and i don't feel as though journalism in and of itself is going to disappear but i do think that especially when we reflect on shifts not only in terms of the journalism space but when we think of social media platforms and changes we're seeing there whether that's to do with regulatory changes who is in charge of particular platforms and also thinking about how politics interacts with this too so parts of the world and um, the uk included where we're seeing efforts on the part of politicians to really prohibit the opportunity for people to protest, yes. to be involved in direct action on the street. I think all of this collides in ways that inevitably impacts journalism and the, the, the shape it takes, what it looks like, how it, it operates. But I don't think that journalism is going to disappear. I think it will continue to adapt to the environment that people find themselves in. And again, this is where I'm hopeful that individuals and communities who've been doing this work for a very long time um, will continue to do so and will also share their, their knowledge to enable others to learn how to contribute to and support such work. So it's hard to determine which came first. You know, did consumers yeah. change or did consumer culture change? And, and people have sort of responded to that. So what's definitely changed is consumer culture, how yeah. brands, how institutions make use of digital technology to promote products and services and establish a name for themselves. And I also think there are times when it, it can be difficult to determine to what extent brands are responding to consumer demand as opposed to um, yeah. telling consumers, yeah. yeah, telling consumers, you're only interested in a 30 second video clip. You don't want to yeah. read a, a piece of writing that takes 10 minutes out of your time. But that's said 
when we reflect on the last several years and the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic, there have definitely been, you know, huge changes and also not just changes, but moments when we have seen sort of frenzied responses to consumer culture, whether that is bulk buying in shops or how people some people overnight were asked to make use of digital media and digital technology to do just about anything and everything in their life when previously they, they hadn't had to. Mm -hmm. So I feel as though, you know, the crisis is ongoing and the impacts of it are still very much felt. And that includes this sort of push towards digital technology and online everything in a way that doesn't necessarily take into account the experiences of people who don't have access to certain resources, who mm -hmm. don't have access to certain techno technological devices, and also who might might be put at risk as a result of being asked to make themselves visible online or participate in what are essentially datafication processes. So I feel as though the, the problem to me is less about a perceived sort of skill deficit and it's it's more issues to do with structural inequality yes. and the, the differences between the material conditions that people are dealing with. So again, I think here it comes back to a lack of access that some people have to resources, to technology, to the means to in, in, engage in some of the um, processes that we're reflecting on or participate in different different places and spaces, including, you know, public discourse or the creation and sharing of counter narratives. So I'm mindful of the fact that sometimes terms such as digital literacy or digital divide or digital deficit can circulate in a way that doesn't take into consideration the fact that what we're fundamentally dealing with are structural inequalities. Exactly, precisely. So I'm less concerned about perceptions with regards to skills deficits and I'm more concerned about how individuals and institutions don't factor in these stark inequalities when encouraging people or compelling people or telling people that they have to make use of certain devices or certain online processes in order to participate in society in various ways. So I think there's lots of steps that need to be taken but if I was to reflect on what some of the first steps would be I feel as though that's an, it, it's ensuring that we don't speak about these experiences as though they are universal in any way. So sometimes even when we discuss generational differences, there can be an assumption that everybody from a particular generation, whether it's those who are referred to as millennials or who are described as boomers, and um, that they all have the same experience. Yeah. But again, as I've been speaking about my students and they share you know, really insightful contributions as part of that discussion, there can be huge differences between um, individuals who are the same age or individuals who live in the same place. So I think a starting point for addressing all of what we're speaking about is recognising the, the inequalities that do exist and specifically their interconnected nature, how racism, sexism, misogyny, ageism, classism and, and, and other forms of oppression intersect in ways that impact different individuals um, and what that means for then discussing and trying to address issues that might be referred to as digital inequalities but actually relate back to just wider societal and structural inequalities that need to be addressed not only in relation to the digital or not only in relation to media experiences. I think it's definitely contributed to it and I would always say with anything, I try to take an approach whereby I can hold on to the hope that's there, but also always stay critical. So when we're speaking about you know, digital media and digital spaces, some people will argue that the way digital technology has changed has democratised you know, media production processes or has resulted in opportunities for people to participate in public discourse and um, when they hadn't had that chance previously. Sometimes there's this perception that gatekeepers can be bypassed. But I feel as though it's important when we're discussing the role of digital media in relation to feminism to think about, well, which feminist perspectives tend to in, involve the most visibility? or who has the ability to speak about feminist issues online um, without facing forms of abuse and harassment or, or certainly without facing specifically forms of um, misogynoir to draw on the work yeah. of Dr Moya Bailey, the intersecting nature of anti-blackness, sexism and misogyny. That said, there are you know, digital media and feminism um, or the relationship between the two has resulted in hugely impactful discussions, activist efforts and the creation of, of new spaces online and offline. So I feel as though certainly there's a lot to be said for that and many people have done research which highlights exactly that. Um, but as we've, we've spoken about, we live in tumultuous times and there are lots of different 
factors that are constantly in flux that can, you know, mean days from now a space that feminists were making use of online to share a message is no longer a space they can access. Or an individual who once made use of a particular digital process as part of the social justice efforts that they're involved in realises that that process has been co-opted or that process is, is no longer effective given what they're facing um, in society at that point in time. So, so many different issues, but <laughs> what, what, yeah, one that one that I'm thinking about is sort of the the erosion of any sense of boundary between um, public, private, personal, professional, and these boundaries or these sort of binary oppositions, they've always been blurred. But especially the way that we've seen employers and institutions um, during and in response to the COVID-19 pandemic, try to find different ways to sort of monitor employees um, or find out what they're doing when working from home, when at home. Um, we've seen you know, so many examples of when individuals have been expected to, you know, have their camera on when participating in a meeting, even though they might be working in an environment that isn't particularly safe or conducive with the ability to work. Or there might be many different reasons why they want to um, refrain from making themselves visible online. So I think a huge issue that digital transformation or however it's referred to has resulted in is the expectation that people make themselves visible online at all times. 24 7. Exactly. And the expectation that they're working 24 7 too, right? So some employers are sort of praising the fact that if an employee no longer needs to commute to work, maybe that adds hours in the day that they can be working. And that, that means there's there's so many issues to do with health, to do with well-being, and to do with the treatment of chronically ill and disabled people um, in particular. So I feel as though AI is, is probably an area that I've got less to comment on and, and, and an area that I haven't researched um, in remotely as much detail as the other topics that we've spoken about. But I do think that just technology in general, so you know, if we take a sector such as the retail sector where a number of customer service or customer experience or customer assistant roles, however they're described by employers, have been impacted by the rise of self-service whereby individuals can you know buy their items without having to interact with an employee um who who they would um you know pay um pay for their items by by um speaking to and engaging with so i feel as though technology in general whether it is you know ai or whether it is the inclusion of different technological Technology. devices and processes that's going to have a huge impact on working life in the future and it already has been having a huge impact um, and I guess also alongside all of this of course a lot of people have many questions around the metaverse and what that is what that isn't what it will be what it won't be and um, but I do feel as though sometimes sometimes the way that these matters are discussed including AI there's sometimes an assumption that things are more developed or in a place um, further along a process than they actually are. And I know that people who are a lot more familiar with the AI space and critical studies of it, some individuals will say that actually the way AI is described in mainstream media, there's a sort of utopian notion of the capabilities of technology, and that's really far from the reality of what's going on. So I think it depends on the, the sector, the job, the technology we're dealing yeah. with, but some of the detrimental effects include um, a loss of jobs um, yeah. and also the creation of additional work and labour. You know, some of these changes are often marketed as, you know, ideally alleviating the work and labour that people need to deal with. Individuals are told that these technological shifts are going to revolutionise um, the working world and working life for people and, and people will find everything a walk in the park. When actually a lot of this technology creates more work, creates more problems, there are huge ethical issues that need to be addressed, um, issues to do with datafication processes, how data is collected, where that goes, who uses that. So. For me, there are so many issues that, that need to be addressed. And anytime I hear about a so-called technological transformation that's meant to sort of help workers, um, I, my ears are, are sort of alert to, to learn more because I've always got questions and I'm always skeptical about the extent to which those changes are gonna help people as opposed to institutions that are pursuing profit. So one of the 
I suppose, again, I'd say maybe more so one of the sort of consumer culture trends that we've seen arise has been just this embracement of nostalgia that I spoke a bit about. And I think, you know, there's so many different brands right now that are really tapping into remember the 90s or, you know, yeah. rem remember those formative years. And there is almost sort of this glow that brands are trying to cultivate and um, to provide people with a source of comfort, or at least that's what they claim it's about, mm -hmm. as opposed to, you know, push products and services. But I think also some of the shifts that we've seen during that time have included people turning away from certain consumerist practices and um, turning away from certain brands, re evaluating you know not only re-evaluating what their life is about or what they want their life to be about but when thinking about the financial implications of these times of crisis and um, many people are, are are struggling to survive and are struggling yes. to live and I feel as though there are lots of brands out there that are trying to remain relevant and are trying to put out marketing and communications that is sensitive to the situations that people are dealing with. But very few are, are going beyond that and are actually recognising there are things they could be doing to try to contribute to or support those who are attempting to um, you know, bring about change in society. So something I speak a bit about in my book in a chapter that's open access is the fact that many brands try to frame themselves as activists, but brands are anything but activists, right? And um, that doesn't mean that they can't find ways to do things differently, whether that is the redistribution of resources or, or you know, making uh, a commitment to support something that's happening beyond words and um, something that is tangible, something that is um, clearly measurable. Um, but with regards to the different the different ways we've seen consumer culture change during this time, I feel as though it's this bizarre mixture of a spike in an emphasis on um, nostalgia um, and, and hedonism and then also the reality that people are, are just doing their best to try to survive and the last thing they want is brands to be selling them these diluted messages of self-care that are ultimately you know not about helping people and are, are about the longevity of the brand. I think for lots of people they're viewing right now as um, or they're viewing I guess recent times as the time after COVID yes. and that's not to say that that's how I view things I, I you know all of this is ongoing and it's ever present but I think brands and institutions political and otherwise have done a good job at trying to imply that COVID is something that's just been and gone you know blink of the eye and um, and the reality is some people are haven't been provided with the space and um, sort of emotionally and otherwise to process all that's been going on and um, people are trying to find you know ways to um feel anything other than misery people are looking for moments of joy moment of moments of comfort and um, people are are trying to create pockets of, of pleasure in their lives and brands recognize that and and mm -hmm. what happens is they they run with the fact that some people are, are remembering a time before and thinking of that fondly whilst despairing in the here and now and um, we see nostalgia become this really marketable gesture whether it's the promotion of a music festival a fast fashion yes. brand and um, there are many people who feel as though those were the normal days or, or the days that they miss and actually anything that that reminds them of that or gives them a chance to relive that may be appealing. So that could be a very very long conversation but I'll, <laughs> I'll keep my response hopefully fairly brief. I think the the work here of Dr Meredith Clark on call-out culture and the etymology of that is crucial to any conversation such as this one and that involves recognising the different ways that individuals and institutions often try to repackage the ways that um, in marginalised individuals particularly black people um, will you know make use of counter narratives have found ways to try to hold people accountable um, and, and what we, we see is individuals and institutions at times in response to that repackage what's going on as cancelling and um, implying that you know those who have been structurally marginalised throughout history suddenly have the power to, to literally delete and erase people um, and that's just not the case as far as I'm concerned. So when it comes to notions of wokeness, yeah. 
you know, we've seen so much going on in terms of how that's discussed, how that it has been um, derided and, and distorted in society. And as part of my research, I've looked at the notion of so-called brand woke washing, where we see brands try to position themselves in proximity to um, black activism, racial justice activism, feminism, to frame themselves um, as an ally or even an activist. But actually in this, this book, Consuming Crisis, some of what I think through is actually how redundant some of these terms often are. Are. And I really try to, I guess, depart from some of what I've previously reflected on and written about to recognise the fact that the language of woke washing and notions of woke wokeness that circulate today are often doing more harm um, than being remotely generative or helpful. And for me, it's actually what's more of more interest to me is not necessarily who or what is labeled woke or woke washing it's who is um expressing that who is making that claim who is comment making that comment and how does the way that they are making that claim or comment reveal a whole host of things to do with power relations oppression and um, agency and the fact that so many individuals and institutions appear to be committed to trying to um prevent those who have been structurally marginalized from speaking out about pushing back against um, and essentially expressing themselves on their own terms. So for me, term even the terms woke culture and cancel culture, they're not terms that I, I feel are, are productive or, or yeah. at this point, they're not terms that I feel, I feel as though they're often emptied of their meaning, right? So I feel as though it's more about how those terms are used um, and, and sort of critically engaging with that, that we can learn a lot about what's really happening. So I think sort of moving away from the language and logic of what culture and cancel culture, for me, what does remain productive and important is that there is space for people to call out. There is space for people um, to push against, to express themselves, to articulate critiques um, without the, the fear of, of being um, sort of regarded as as nothing but a cancellor um, or without the concern that they're going to be labeled as as woke as, as though that label itself um Negative. even even means anything depending on, on who's making that that statement or claim so i think it's important at this point to recognize that wokeness in terms of its roots in black american culture and history and um activism that absolutely always needs to be acknowledged and I think what's really unfortunate is that we're at a point in time when so many different societies whether it's the UK or the US um, have co-opted appropriated um, this term and its meanings and its origins um, and, and we just see these these words circulating in ways that are simultaneously meaning, meaningless and involve a weaponization which is why for me woke culture and cancel culture they're not terms that I would, would be drawn towards. Instead, I would be asking, how are these terms being used? And what does that tell us about who really has the power and the lengths they're going to to try and obstruct anybody else um, from commenting on, calling out and being able to express their voice publicly? Wow, so many different trends. <laughs> <laughs> I feel as though the influencer culture industry is is always moving it's it's always adapting there's always something new popping up we've seen the development of computer generated influencers also referred to as virtual influencers and that's a space that i would have thought will continue to expand and alter in different ways and other potential changes um, might involve the sort of decline of certain social media platforms or online content sharing platforms that right now some individuals perhaps couldn't imagine um you know no longer being here so so there are lots of different changes that are always happening with regards to digital technology in general. But right now, and you know, thinking about social media, we are seeing so many rumblings and concerns and critiques about um, the potential for people to use platforms in the way that they've been used to doing so for so long. And lots of discussions, lots of discourse to do with free speech, um, to do with the ability to participate in activism online and to do with safety. Know that you can make use of these different devices and spaces without having to share 
without having to share in a way that makes you uncomfortable. And what I mean by that, sometimes when we speak about social media, there's this focus on what's visible and there's this focus on what's publicly available. When actually lots of people have social media platforms and accounts and they predominantly um, use them to engage with other people's content. They don't necessarily post anything or they post, um, you know, very scarcely. So I guess that's my way of saying my advice would be just because you decide to make use of a, a social media platform or engage with a digital space doesn't mean you have to make yourself um, visible. Um, but I would also caveat that by saying you still need to be aware of the fact that um, even if you don't think you're making yourself very visible, chances are you might be more visible um, than, than you realise. Yeah. Exactly. Whether that's to the people behind the creation of the platform um, or, or different audiences online. Um, I'd say nothing lasts forever and you can turn away from a platform, you can disengage. Um, but again, that doesn't mean that that your use of that platform is going to be erased, right? So yes. I speak a lot about digital footprints, digital traces with students. We reflect on you know, what it means to move around online without knowing um, what impression has been left or, or how that, that movement turns into data. Um, but yeah, I guess that final piece of advice would be um, knowing that you can disengage from, disconnect from, um, but that doesn't mean that that where you once were disappears entirely.